Google. I know. Isn't that funny? Yeah, the just. Maybe Google will. <laughs> I'm sure we've got some some friends here. They'll just implant them, them at some Google. point. Just. No, they got the Google glasses, and the. We can TikTok leave the world all together. Yeah. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, we are ready to go. Welcome, everybody. I am Jeremy Quant, and I represent Dot Red. Uh, we are based in Los Angeles. It's our first time here in Seattle. Uh, one thing I noticed that was uh, interesting about uh, Seattle versus LA, I was actually given the opportunity to hang with a good friend, Michael, who took me around the city of Seattle and he mentioned to me while we were going to check out Union Station and the gum wall, he mentioned that there are about nine modes of transportation in Seattle. <laughs> you've got the trolley, you've got the light rail, the subway, driving, and you've got so many modes. Right. Yes. In LA, you've got driving, a, your car, or carpooling with a friend who's also driving to their destination. So yeah. it's so nice to be here, to be uh, have a walkable city. So, so Dot Red, we're uh, an online and hybrid events platform for art exhibitions. We work with galleries, artists, museums, and fairs to augment their in-person exhibitions online. And we do that through form of media. Thank you to our friends over here at the Elite um, Collective. Uh, as well as podcasts to augment conversations that gives you a, a unique listening experience to the exhibition, uh, something that we miss sometimes when we're in a, a in-person exhibition is the conversations that happen, especially if you miss it and you're like, what happened? And that is an experience that we want to augment online. You're never going to get the in-person experience, but we do our best to bring that to a, a, a viewer who, who cannot make it on, on, an, online. So uh, I want to thank you to all of our partners. Uh, I want to thank the Seattle Art Fair. Uh, we're a, a cultural partner of the Seattle Art Fair. I want to thank uh, the uh, Elite Collective. I want to thank the uh, Northwest African American Museum. We have Dr. Claire here. If you guys are ever interested in shows that they're doing, please connect with her. Um, I also want to thank Gray Sky Gallery. Where's Miss Bryn? You guys, if you guys are interested in any works, please talk to Miss Bryn. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank uh, Joseph, who, yes, pointing at you, Joseph, who made such a huge, huge contribution to helping all of this happen. Um, I want to thank John Goodwin, who made it. I want to thank Barbara Earl Thomas. And so just a, a couple housekeeping notes. Uh, if you do need to use the bathroom, it is right there. Uh, we have, for now, the bar closed uh, until the program is over. Uh, so please keep, um, keep seated. And if, uh, please put your phones on silence. I know mine is ringing like no other, so I'm gonna put it on silence. <laughs> And so uh, why we're here, oh. let me move a little closer to my group here. So why we're here is, you know, there's a lot going on in the art world. There is social justice movements going on. There are museums that are doing deassessing. There are uh, artists uh, that are getting more representation, um, artists of color, female artists. And we want to find out, you know, is there a trend going on or is there something fundamental around the art world that <coughs> is, is happening today? And we have, I, I'm, I feel so blessed to have such a diverse panel of collectors, gallery representatives and artists that can help bring some some uh, identity to what's actually going on. And so uh, I'm going to give their bios, uh, then we're going to ask our questions. After the questions, we'll have a Q&A. 
And after Q&A, we'll finish out and the, the bar uh, and reception will be back open. And that's how we will get the program going. I want to thank all of our live streamers who are online. Uh, our a good friend and uh, my advisor, George, it's his birthday tomorrow. So George, happy birthday to you. Uh, and uh, our other advisor, Dr. Stephanie. Uh, and again, thank you to our team. So I'll get to the bios and I'm gonna sit my butt down. All right, so we're gonna start uh, from the left here to the right, start with Barbara Earl Thomas. Barbara Earl Thomas is a visual artist based in Seattle, challenging established norms through her artistic creations, which explore themes of activism, identity, and social justice. By examining her artistic processes, intentions, and community engagement, we gain valuable insight into how artists reshape the art world. We approach her work discussing um, her work as uh, art of the moment, and does it offer real substance to those collected and have collected in the past? Artists like her play a significant role in redefining the boundaries of art, inspiring meaningful dialogue, and encouraging critical questions, illuminating body, uh, excuse me, uh, encouraging critical questions of our assumptions. Thomas is represented by Claire Oliver Gallery in New York, uh, The Illuminated Body, Thomas's tour, uh, touring exhibition, currently on view at the Chrysler Art Museum, Norfolk. Yes. Well, tr <laughs> yes. Have to see it. Uh, which also travels to Wichita Museum of Art and the author of Ross Gallery in the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you. We have Joseph Vaskovitz. Joseph is an arts advocate and activist collector, bringing his expertise as a collector to the panel with a particular focus on works from the African diaspora and Latinx community. Vaskovitz explores how collectors respond to the shifting socio-cultural landscape and how their motivations for collecting have evolved while maintaining the natural motive, motif of collecting timeless art. Many collectors have now become active supporters of artists who address social issues and seek artworks that resonate with their current spirit of the times. So thank you, Joseph. And last but not least, John Goodwin, director of, director of Community Philanthropy at the Portland Art Museum. We'll delve into ways museums serve as platforms for fostering dialogue, challenging conventions, and amplifying underrepresented voices. Museums are redefining their collections and narratives by acquiring and displaying artworks that address cru crucial themes such as racial justice, climate change, gender equality, and political unrest. Portland Art Museum opens Black Artists in, of Oregon in September and will be the only West Coast venue for the November opening of Africa Fashion. So the first question I wanna bring to is Joseph. You know, as a collector, what is your philosophy on art collecting? Um, so I have to be honest, I don't have a lot of filters, and sometimes I think things and I say them and I shouldn't, so apologies in that. advance, he knows that. Mm -hmm. um, when Jeremy first asked me to um, talk about how my wife and I collect, um, one of the things I said was that we don't do this and we don't do that and we don't do this other thing. and we don't, because you spend a lot of your time in the art world when people are showing you art saying what you don't do versus what you do collect. So I'll start by saying um, we collect the best art we can by the best artists we can find. Um, we have collected in the past uh, very geographically. Uh, we don't do that as much anymore. Uh, and so we're not um, as in tune with the local community. But um, we collect African diaspora, 
a diaspora, sorry, thinking in two languages, um, and uh, Latinx, and we focused a lot on uh, gender and social issues, especially in the last, I don't know, six, seven years when uh, Lisa, my wife, who is somewhere else, uh, began to be involved in a lot of equity boards and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion boards. And um, uh, that, I mean, honestly, that is it, basically. You know, we don't care about the times. We don't care about the political issues of the moment. Um, we find artists who are great, and that's what they do. They communicate that. Um, Barbara's work from 25 years ago is as politically relevant today as it was 25 years ago um, because she's a very good artist and the thematic content of her, of her work speaks to certain issues. Um, we bought our first piece, I don't know, it's probably longer than 25 years. Uh, and we ended up giving it to this guy down here uh, because they had a real need to show it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, did I cover the question? Can I stop? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I was going to suggest, what you just said, because not only do they collect, but they collect to give. So they not only give us art, but they loan it to museums all over the world, and we are most appreciative. And I think one of the things that... Um, Joseph Prince, he's also an art maker. So he comes to the looking at art and the seeing of the art through the eye of a maker. So I think it allows him to see the work in a way that other collectors may not and understand process in a way that other collectors may not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, I had the, uh, the pleasure of going to your home, seeing some of the collection and your work and I, so impressed with your uh, not only uh, you know ability to paint, but also just finding what is really interesting and and really exploring works around you and in the world. So thank you. I uh, want to move it to Mr. John um, over at Portland Art Museum. So you know, you know, I know the Portland Art Museum has a permanent collection. Um, you know what? You know, if has been your involvement with the permanent collection and where things are going in terms of this, this shifting environment, what's, what's going on? Yeah, sure. Um, we are doing every single thing that we can to do the same kind of work that Joseph mentioned. We are looking at women artists, we're looking at African American artists, we're looking at Asian artists, we're looking at um, artists from all over the world that we don't have in the museum. And we have been really, really lucky in that our board has come along with us. Um, it was an interesting time in the beginning. I just, I was a docent at the museum about 25 years ago. And then I was took a I took a job at the Trailblazers down in Portland, and I was there for eight years. And for eight of the, six of those years, I was on the board at the art museum. So I have a different perspective. And after the six years, they asked me to join as a staff person. And during that time, we first initiated the exhibition for Hank Willis Thomas. And it was extraordinary for our board to look at the opportunity or the possibility of having a major survey by a black artist. And what we did is we chatted with them about the possibility and they, as I do now, I'm in development. I thought about the money and will we get people in the museum? Will we be able to sell tickets? And I said, yes, we will. And I told them that if they will give us the opportunity to do this, we'd know that we'll be able to get the folks in the museum to see it. And we hope that we'll be able to build on that for other exhibitions. We did Hank Willis Thomas's. It was one of the biggest shows we've ever had in the museum. I really appreciate that. And the way we got them more involved is we did a limited edition print. We said, this is a limited edition print of this incredible artist. You don't know who he is right now because he was not well known in 2018, but now he's one of the world's most popular artists. They purchased the artwork from us, one of the prints that we published, and then each of them had the pride of ownership in the piece, so they would bring all of their friends in to see it, and all their grandkids and aunts and uncles and everybody, so we had a built-in audience because now they're a collector of his work. That worked out really well, and then we needed to make a lot more money, so we had Nefertari. 
So we had Hank Willis Thomas, then we had Nefertari, and then we had uh, Jeffrey Gibson and Oscar Howe, two Native American artists. And now we're having Af Af uh, black artists of Oregon, and then we're having Africa fashion. So there's the theme. <laughs> we're getting away from the traditional shows that we normally have. We're having a little bit of pushback. Some of the folks are like, when are you going to get back to the traditional art? So we have 18th century, 17th century work all over the museum. Take a peek, and we're going to have this little space for some other things. So we're doing everything we can to not only show those works, but we actually purchase works from those artists when we have those exhibitions. And uh, anything that we can do to add them to the collection is what we're doing. So. Wow. Yeah. I that's huge. I mean, you should give, give it up to, to them, to Portland Art Museum, yeah. really mm -hmm. pushing, yeah. Yeah. pushing boundaries. Yeah. Have one tiny quick thing. We visited Barbara's studio today, and uh, there was uh, eight or ten of us. I was the only black person other than Barbara. <laughs> and, and when we left there, they said that out of all the studios we visited, all were white folks, which were wonderful. And we also visited the museum and a couple other spaces with amazing homes. But hers was the one that they appreciated the most because of the warmth and the genuine way that she treated them. And we greatly appreciate that, Barbara. Well, and, and, yeah. and these are the people making the decisions. And they saw you and appreciated what you did. So I think that's going to work out not only for you, but other folks that look like us. Well, I think that one of the things you said about the 18th century work that's up, I think that you know, from an artist standpoint, I think what's important to us um, is to not have it be either or. Yeah, right. It's us and. Correct. And because we also are in art history, mm -hmm. we're not an anomaly of art history, but we are in art history. So to be shown with whether it's Fragonard or whether it's with um, whomever, it's important that people come through and they see but that we're normalized. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you think about the schools and how people thought, thought about, say, kids who are otherly abled or whatever, and then they started to mainstream people, we want to be mainstreamed. Right. Yeah. You know, we want to be in the mix. Yeah. And, you know, you can, I could sit next to whoever, Picasso or whoever they are, and we could have a conversation. Yeah. Matisse? Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely Matisse with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it'd be a great conversation. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious, the... I mean, you've done quite a few exhibitions. Have you seen a trend of, of collectors over the last decade purchasing your work? Like, what's, what's, been, your, what's been your experience, and, and who are they? Well, I think I come to this, I'm a long hauler. You know, I'm one of these people who I've been in, I've been making work for, you know, I have to stop saying 30 years, because now it's more than that, 40 years. And I... Um, I mean, perhaps if what's happening now in my life had happened when I was 30 or 35, I would think I was all that in a bag of chips. Yes. But uh, I'm one of those people where I have always, my work has always sold. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, sort of, I mean, along with the trends of what Seattle was, my work has always sold. But I've always worked it. I've never been one of those people where, you know, I just, okay, put the work in the gallery. Like three or four weeks before the show, anyone who'd expressed interest in my work, I'd go out. Poor Francine. You know, she, yeah. uh, she said, what, you're going to sell? I said, well, you know, I've worked for the last two years. I can't not sell the work. Yeah. And if this is like I have to wait for people to come, I, so I, that's been the mix for me. So... The work has sold, but I would say that probably in the last 20, 25 years, the clip, it's, it's sold at a, at, a, at a much quicker clip. <laughs> and um, so I've been surprised and amazed. And I'm not one of these people who I don't take it for granted. I'm like, I go, I look at Joseph yes. and everyone. I said, you know, I can appreciate it. I mean, I've always expected my work to be in in um, whatever the movement is, but I, and I'm not quite sure yet if, in fact, I can um, look at the trend enough to know whether or not I'm in a trend or if this is a thing that's going to go on. Mm. Um, because when you're inside of something, you can't quite analyze it. Mm. Like I don't think we'll understand what COVID has done to us for another five or six or ten years. Yeah. So that's kind of where I am. I'm I'm hoping that. I am part of the actual conversation. I try to be. I, um, I'm really careful about how I let people market me. 
Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I'm really careful about that. You know, I am not your thing of the moment. And, and if that's what it is, then we are not going to play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think of a quote that um, James Baldwin said when he was interviewed about his work. Someone said, do you, um, do you think you're making work that, you know, people will talk about and uh, be y- that, you know, you'll be in the canon and, and, and remembered? He said, my work is about right now and where I am in the world, this moment. And he says, I have no control over how people remember me, if they remember me. I'm here now. So that's kind of the ticket I take for myself. Mm. Yeah, great. Uh, Something I'm reminiscent of, Nina Simone, you know, is is the quote of, you know, artists are supposed to represent uh, the times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, bring the times as as present as possible. Uh, And and, in talking about, you know, folks buying your work, and uh, moving to, to Joseph a bit about the, the art world. And, and you know, let, let's keep it real. I mean, the art world is, can be a little cryptic. <laughs> you know, the work that is being sold to, to others as well as being um, purchased, right? Uh, it isn't quite as a fair game as, as we, all, we all think. Um, but, you know, what has been your experience uh, of that art world, I mean, we've talked about, you know, the game, right? I mean, I th- in every industry, there is something to to be had. It's and to be aware of it. Uh, and so, Joseph, what's been the experience, you know, of buying and um, buying work from galleries or, or or artists, and and what you see in the future for for collectors and and how they navigate, you know finding work? So um, I've done a number of these panels, uh, typically at around art fairs, and, and usually the question is put to me, how do you buy art as a young collector? Um, which is kind of the flip side a little bit of that question. Uh, it presupposes you're not in the game. Um, when um, I started uh, buying art, seriously, um, African art, um, contemporary paintings, not to be confused with carvings, there's no value judgment, but I was focused on paintings and sculpture. Uh, It was 30 years ago, and um, people, I I think I jokingly said this to you the other day, people would say, please, take it home. You know, put it up, keep it for a month, and then if you like it, pay us, and if not, you pay to send it back, we'll send it to you. Uh, now if you go in a booth at an art show, uh, typically you have 30 seconds yeah. if you have that long <laughs> to make your decision. Um, uh, a black art is a commodity. There are um, lots of uh, panels and discussions about black art as a uh, fiscal commodity. I mean, there's been newspaper articles, etc. Um, When we got into it in depth, um, we did it when there was very little representation. Um, We bought art in Africa because I I was working there. Uh, Then Europe, the artists came to America or they showed with African-American artists in the US. Um, And so we were introduced to those artists. I mean, a lot of the artists we bought back then are now household names, but Uh, They had little to no sales. Uh, And we just saw it uh, as something we could do. Um, We could get behind this, we could focus on it, and we could get it out in the community. So when people, uh, so I'm going to circle back. Um, When people ask me about the game, um, I have almost no difference between young collectors and experienced collectors. What I say is, you need to find a gallery whose aesthetics match your gal- your aesthetics. You go in, you go in as often as you can, you make yourself known. It doesn't matter if you buy, you introduce yourself, you look at the wall, you find out why they're showing the art and why it appeals to you, you build a rapport, and at some point they will say to you, you like this? You should get one. We're, you know, this artist is going to open next month. I want you to get one. You have been 
hear a lot. You have, um, it, it's part of the game. You go from there to several galleries. Uh, you become knowledgeable. You talk the talk. Um, but let's face it, uh, when something's a commodity, it doesn't matter whether it's stock mm -hmm. or uh, a pair of new sneakers Gold. at a store. You, you have to know what the game is. Um, and um, that game, so I, I love stories. Um, I'm standing it at an opening of a fairly well-known artist, and uh, a couple of people I know are standing with this guy who's, I mean, he's dressed the way I dressed, which is uh, uh, jeans and a t-shirt, not as nicely as I'm dressed today, jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> and I'm curious who he is because my friends know him. And we get to chatting, and I don't say, who are you? But we get to chatting, and I ask him, uh, has he bought the artist on the wall? And he said, yeah, I got one finally. And I say, oh, you don't buy a lot from this gallery? And he said, no, they finally let me buy something. Mm -hmm. I said, it's a lot of work. He said, well, he said, I went to a show in New York, and there was a very famous artist, and uh, I was chatting, and the artist said, do you like my work? And I said, I do, but, but everything's sold. I can't buy anything. And the artist said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. So what do you do? Who, who are you? He said, I produce the Batman movies. <sighs> the artist is now crushed yeah. because he yeah. wants his work at this space. So I said, so did you get a work? He said, no, I don't play the game. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sell me the work. I'm not buying the work. I have other places to buy. Mm -hmm. And the artist can go back and tell the gallery to look around at, you know, young African-Americans who come in. He wasn't that young, but compared yeah. to me, he was young. Yeah. Young African-Americans yeah. who come in and get them to collect the work of other young African-Americans. Um, it's one of the reasons we switched over to investing heavily in the Latinx market. It's woefully underrepresented by museums around the United States other than, you know, uh, Pam in Miami. Yeah. I mean, there's a few places. I'm not going to throw too many names out. But, um, and one of the things we do is we build up a sizable collection. Um, and we go to museums in Portland, in L.A., in um, Seattle, and we tell curators what we have. The work is available. Please borrow it. I sidetracked from your question. Um, but uh, I'll tie it all together. Mm -hmm. um, playing the game is something you have to decide if you want to do. If you're a young collector and you go to a couple of galleries and you're there, pretty soon the door is open. If you're a collector with a ton of money, uh, you have to do the same thing. You just let the dealer know you got a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> or you say, don't care. Yeah. I'm not going to play the game. Yeah. yeah. There is no secret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, there really is no secret. Uh, I know Barbara, if there's a young artist and Barbara likes the young artist, I might call Barbara, say, can you call the artist? Can you ask the gallery if they'll sell us a work, introduce me to the artist? Mm -hmm. If you care about the artist, go to their studio. They're not always having shows. Eventually it comes around, but there is no secret. Yeah. It's, it's work. Lots of work. Mm -hmm. Lots yeah. of work. Yep. yep. And it is a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same way yeah. if you want to buy sneakers, you get to the line of the, s you find yeah. out when they're yeah. shipping, yeah. you get to the line <laughs> yeah. of the store at 8 o'clock, the store <laughs> opens at 10. It is work. Mm -hmm. May I follow up on Joseph's? Sure. Quick. Yeah. The, I just wanted to say I have a. There was another Joseph in Portland who used to help me with uh, help me with acquisitions and telling me what I should be looking at. His name was Ed Cadero. Poor thing. He's no longer with us. But the amazing collection. And when they called me at this point, this was maybe. 20 years ago, they were using slides. He says, John, look at these slides. I got one. You need to get one of these. It was Gary Simmons, uh, amazing artist that does these drawings on chalk. And um, so I called the, the gallery in New York, and I said, I'd like to get one. And they're like, we don't have any. I was like, well, I, I was told that you had some. Well, no, we don't have any. And he, they said, well, who did you hear that from? I said, from Ed Cadero. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, okay. 
we can take a look. Which one were you interested in? I'm like, well, you just didn't have any. But, okay, this is the one I like, and I was able to get it. And so it's, and then and, and after that, then I was part of who they would like to talk with about purchasing work. So it's, it's, it's how you play the game. And I, my, my husband is, is white, and we would go into galleries, and I would ask a question. And, and sometimes I'd even say, I'm with the art museum, and they would still answer him. Because they felt he was probably the person who was going to be, and he's like, he's making the decision. You should be talking to him. But it's it's an interesting game that we have to yeah, play. Yeah, we're not going to go through there with Lisa. Yeah. I mean, she gets the same thing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then I say, we buy together. If she's not interested, yeah. or we're she not doesn't, buying. we're not buying. Right. And then all of a sudden, they, they have to belligerently sometimes, I think, talk to both of us. Right, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's so hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, it's it's a very interesting game, and I think it's important to know that there is one, and the more aware we all become, you know, black, white, gay, straight, we become um, uh, better aficionados, become better advocates uh, to not only be stewards of art, um, but also be advocates uh, and, and share those uh, works uh, of artists with, with others. Uh, I'm going to uh, tailor back to, to John uh, with what's going on with the Portland Art Museum. And just a general question is like, how do artists even get into yeah. to shows and how, you know, who picks them, yeah. right? Because I think we've, uh, curators have, have kind of the star quality of who they're, they're choosing, but, you know, right. how do artists get in and, and what's, yeah. what's the inner workings yeah. like? Yeah, naturally, you folks know the curator is the decision maker, uh, but as the person who finds the money for the curators to do this work, I have a little bit of influence too. And what we do is we have a calendar that's out to like 2026, and we look at all the spots where we need things, and then we d discuss where we're going to be, um, whose exhibitions we think we might be able to get, which ones that we think might be most profitable, which you have to unfortunately listen, look at every single time, um, how big they'll be, which space they'll be in. And um, what we always like for uh, the curators to do is they, they look at a broad scope of everything that we should be looking at and doing, and you asked the question about what should the artists do. Um, artists should always, as, as uh, Joseph said, play the game. And it's not playing a game. It's just like hanging out in the galleries. And when you see other people there, getting to know them, getting to know the gallerists, and the curators and I always go to every single opening that we get an invitation to. One of us tries to go, and we share what we saw with the other person. And the, when you, the other artists that are there should connect with us. And, and I have an Instagram uh, following, and sometimes people will DM me on there and say, can you stop by my gallery or stop by my studio? And I do every single one that I can possibly make. I rarely miss one. Um, sometimes it's not your art. But but I go and 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 sometimes you find some amazing jewels that you would really like to have in the museum. So they have to be as connected as they possibly can be, and and let them let us know that you're doing work that we should be seeing. If we if we don't like it the first time, the next time you do another batch of works that you've changed or improved, let us know again, and and we will come and take a look. And that's one of the best ways of getting to know the museum and the galleries and the people that help make the decisions about getting your work in there. But well, Barbara I think from better. the other side, you know, because this side, the, the art side, I think you, there, there, are, there are a couple of lines of logic that sometimes artists are either in, they're educated with or they um, come to the table with. You know, I'm in the studio, I make my work, I don't talk to anybody, yeah. you know, it's all about the work, you know, and the work speaks for itself. Yes. And, you know, there's that. <laughs> there you know, is and that. If, if you come from, like, the, you know, the 70s and 80s, where I came from, that really was kind mm -hmm. of how I entered the, the, the stream, you know. It's like, and, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to touch the money, you don't want to, because it might make you not into Van Gogh, yeah. and you want to cut your ear off, you want to suffer. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I actually always um, had a job, and that's another thing. I mean, there's so many artists who, you know, they can go and be in their studio full-time every minute and don't have to make, support anybody, a family or anything. I just never had that, that idea, and I think that because I was, you know, I, I learned early on, 
when I when I went to art school, I was going like, so let me try to understand what people are looking at. Let me try to understand art and form. Can I understand that magazine? Still can't quite, but um, <laughs> the whole idea of putting yourself out in front of people. And so I think early on I got the, um, the, the message that my job was just to show up. Mm -hmm. And as I tell people, I have been ignored by some very high level people. And, um, but you know, walking up and putting your hand out, shaking people's hand, introducing yourself. I introduced myself to one guy so many times. He says, Barbara, I know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> and it was this guy who's got more money than God. And, um, and I said, you said my name. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, and I walked away. I said, you said my name. And that was part of the point of it was that I needed him to connect with my face. And I, and I think for, for people, you show up, you introduce yourself. It's um, exhausting. And um, I know also being from Seattle, it's definitely double exhausting because mm. you're way over here. And I was saying to Jeremy, I said, you know, the, everything is pointed east, at least yes. the way I see mm -hmm. it. People in California don't even look north or south. They look east. So I had to try to throw myself into the east so that I could get on the radar because I just wasn't on yeah. the radar. And um, so I think playing the game and um, get over getting your feelings hurt, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? I, I used to think curators were um, not quite the equivalent of, of church deacons or professors, but um, people for whom you were always asking questions on, but never giving an, never, never asking, always asking them questions. How do I do this? What do I say? But never telling them mm -hmm. what to do. Um, you know, the more educated I get, the more educated Lisa gets, the more curators are um, really interested in what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. right? Um, I speak to curators not quite daily, almost daily over uh, email and DMs, and um, we get a visit more often than once a month mm -hmm. by someone from somewhere in North America or Europe uh, who's passing through, and they want to know what I'm seeing. You know, they, they have a finite body. They can only mm -hmm. be in so many places. Um, doesn't matter they're in London or New York. They still want to know. You know, they see I've bought good art, and they want to know who I'm looking at. Um, and so uh, I think part of what good collectors do, and it doesn't matter how many works you have, but, you know, John does this a lot. Part of what good collectors do is they tell people about the work they have. Um, they present the artist's work. Mm -hmm. um, so we need the barbers to come forward and tell us what they're doing, and then we act as a... Uh, you know, an amplification of that. Um, and I can give you a list of, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 artists who have gotten shows because their work has been in our house. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. and big shows. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a healthy ecosystem if it works and it's not as structured as people, as your question might lead people mm. to believe. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is... Definitely work in progress. Yeah, and, and speaking of channels, uh, yeah, you mentioned folks going uh, to your studio. Mm -hmm. Joseph, you mentioned curators mm -hmm. coming to, to your home. Uh, John, you know, folks going to the museums. Uh, where mm -hmm. are folks showing up? I mean, we also have social media, we have the internet. Uh, has mm -hmm. that lens shifted, right, where are, are you and, and Barbara, for, for you, are you finding, you know, collectors, m most of them coming straight to your studio, or are, are they seeing you via, like, Instagram or your website? A and I'll actually go down um, to Joseph and, and ask the same questions, but I'll, I'll start with you. I actually don't know. You know, I actually don't know if someone sees my work on Instagram. I mean, I have a lot of people who talk to me on, on, on the Instagram and <laughs> uh, Facebook <laughs> and, you know, those kinds of things. And uh, people, what, what, what that does do is it gives me a, a broader image, audience for image, and people are sometimes very, they're very voluble. You know, they'll talk to you 
in the DM, I really love this, and that's really wonderful for me, but I don't know if in the end it ends up that it, you know, inspires my market or not. It, you know, maybe it does. I don't have any idea. I do know, and I do feel that, um, again, people like Joseph and then now with John, you, the artist needs an advocate. You know, you need yeah. someone who champions mm -hmm. your work and gets through the door and says, you know, uh, I saw Barbara's work mm -hmm. and I think you ought to go over there. Yes. Because they need that extra impetus in order because that's a big deal. You know, they got to figure out how, if they're going to work you into their schedule, if they're going to, you know, add you to their busy agenda. And if they don't have that extra nudge, and I think that uh, with me, it's so funny, I, um, I, I always say that a lot of my shows have come from people who are just leaving a museum. The first time I got any work in Sam was when Bruce Gunther yes. Yes. Oh yeah. was leaving Sam. Yes. And I said, when I, I wondered, I said, well, you know, is it because you're leaving? <laughs> is, is that <laughs> it? <laughs> and then when I um, got a show at Sam, uh, Kimberly was leaving. Yeah. And I won't say that, you know, that made Sylvia Wolf leave the Henry, but yeah. <laughs> but actually I have been Don't put a show in my house. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> <laughs> I um I feel like I have been chosen actually more not so much by the curators, but because I've known the directors. So I don't know if that mm. was a way interesting in but I just it's just kind of what's happened to me and then I've tried to parley it. I've tried to figure out who else I should meet mm -hmm. and how to meet them. And um, I won't say I've been shameless, but I definitely <laughs> am not averse to walking up with my hand out. I always go like this because I figure, why not? Or you grabbed their face. Oh, I did. I did. I grabbed <laughs> your face and I said, I said, you're so cute. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> Come to my studio. No. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> John, I know you. <laughs> yeah, no, because I'd seen the photo and I kind of like did a, a Joseph. I kind of acted before I thought. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of did it. I loved it. Love it, love awesome. it, love it. Uh, you know, great, great response. Uh, same question to you, Joseph. Where are you finding So ours? this is a really broad audience. Like, I don't know who's behind the camera. I don't know if you're just coming to it, if you're experienced, if you're you know, building your collection. So it gets very hard to answer a question like that succinctly. Uh, I have done panels where the focus is on uh, discovering art via the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have a lucky streak uh, finding art on the internet. Um, some uh, major artists who are now selling for five or six figures I discovered for a few thousand dollars um, on the internet. I bought a piece by an artist as a show for $40,000 work, and I bought a piece online the same week the show opened for $500 on the internet on a bizarre site. Um, uh, Which site? No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'll plug it. I'll yeah. tell you. Uh, I think it's called First Thursday. It's an auction. It's an internet auction site. It's on Instagram. It's just some woman who gets her friends to give her small works, and yeah. she uh, supports them with s with sales. First Thursday. For I think it's called First Thursday. Maybe First Something Thursday, but you'll f mm. you'll find Fine. it. Mm. Um, so I um, I paint in the mornings. I have a thriving uh, studio practice. Um, I paint till sometime around lunch, and then I go home and I spend hours uh, researching. I, uh, I'm the registrar for our collection. I have to fend all the museum questions about loans. So in the afternoon, I am deep, deeply involved in art. Uh, I don't expect other people who want to buy art to have to do that. But um, for those of you who are old enough, there was a woman who used to write about movies named Pauline Kael. Uh, I don't know how old you have to be to know that name, but she was before Siskel and Ebert. And um, that's what you did. You read Pauline Kael's reviews to decide if you should go to see a movie. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is, uh, you want to know about collecting art? 
You come to panels like this. You get yourself educated. You're in town, there's a, sh there's a, a trade fair. You go to the fair, you see the Seattle Art Fair, you like something in a booth, you introduce yourself to the people in the booth, you get your name on a mailing list. Um, you pick a couple of magazines to read. And, and these days, about half of them are free, mm -hmm. so I'm not asking you, if you're serious, you pay for a subscription to Art News. Yep. Um, but I think you can even get most of that for free. Um, there is so much information, and you just have to decide how deep you want to wait out. Yeah. Uh, and start with your local museum. We have five, six, seven in this town. If you start going beyond the top three, there's a lot of museums in Seattle um, that feature art in some form or another. Um, there's a lot of information, and not every artist they put on the wall sells for huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. um, and then this one is a little more work. Um, but if you see a picture on Instagram, okay, one last story. Um, saw this beautiful painting on Instagram. Really liked it. Had never heard of the artist. The first person who liked it was Amy Sherald. Okay. If you don't know that name, she painted Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. I figure if she liked this woman, mm -hmm. I should pay attention to this artist. Mm -hmm. I looked and saw who else liked that work. Okay, mm -hmm. um, We bought a work from this woman before her first show opened. Um, I'm very thrilled with the work. If it goes up in value, my kids will be happier. If it doesn't, I love the work. Mm -hmm. I don't really buy it for the value, but I'm just saying there's a... And it's a testament because your home is wall-to-wall -wall yes. with art. There's <laughs> a few little spaces. Yeah. Still, you know. he just, he's just missing his ceiling. Yeah. The ceiling yeah. is pretty much the only space. So do you think that there's a... Do you have labels for kind of... I mean, is it the casual... Let's say the day trader or the, the kind of, of collector that there is? I mean, do you... Do you categorize them in your own mind as to who's what kind of a collector? So um, I have maybe six, eight, ten friends that I talk to somewhere between daily and weekly. Uh, the mother of a curator of a big museum, a professional football player, uh, a Nigerian banker. I love just saying that. Because it's sort of like the, in, the uh, Hotmail thing. Hey, I'm a Nigerian banker and mm -hmm. a print. Yeah. Um, I have uh, someone who's on the board of the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, we talk regularly, and all we do is just tell each other what we see. Mm -hmm. It is no different than people who fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is, I'm demystifying this for you. Okay, it is no different than people who fish who say, you should go to Yellowstone and just outside a couple hours is this great spot and there's a, a, a decent guide there. Don't go to the fancy places, but w we do all that. And um, if I find something I like, I tell the other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a lower level. Mm -hmm. There's the person who just wants one thing mm -hmm. in their living room, <laughs> and that person should, whether you've got $10 mm -hmm. or $10 million, should do what I said. Go, go to a bunch of galleries, find a gallery near them that they like because the art on the wall appeals to them, go a few times, and then explain to the people in the gallery why that art appeals to them, give them their budget, and they will work with you. You can tell them, I'm only buying Latinx. Mm -hmm. I'm only buying Israeli art. Mm -hmm. I'm only mm -hmm. buying, there's yeah. a very famous woman in town who for years only bought art that was white. Mm -hmm. The color. The yeah. color white. Mm. She didn't care who did it or what country they came from. White. But it had to be white. And we didn't laugh at her. That was her thing. That was just her, that was just her style. That was that just was what just her, her interest style. was. We didn't laugh at her face. But <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's not true. She bought amazing <laughs> art. Mm -hmm. Cutting edge. And 
really, and she gave a lot of it away when she was done with it to mm -hmm. museums. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Um, I'll ask it's the same it's question to, very, to you, very John. similar. You covered a lot of it. The um, uh, Art News, Art in America. I love those magazines. I love when they have the top 100 collectors, of which you were one. And I look at what those folks are collecting. My wife and I, so because she's yes, not Lisa here. and yes. Joseph. Yes, so they're both in there. But I, I like to see what they're collecting because they know what they're doing, and I'm less good at that. So I see what they're collecting, but I have to absolutely love it. I can't just go, Joseph likes this, so I have to buy one. I look at it, and if I love it and my husband loves it, then we go forward. But um, you have to have to have to have it. Like you said, if it goes up in value, cool. If it doesn't, that's great. I love it. That's why I bought it. Um, I also, like you said, with Instagram, I like the, the likes and who's looking at it, but also the comments and what they're saying about it and what they're doing. And then Joseph and I are part of this, I don't know what we would call it, with Joy and How and Dee and all those folks that we hang out with when we go to other exhibitions and things around um, LA or wherever the fairs are. And we communicate and they tell me, it's like, oh, John, you can't, you need to go to LA and you need to see this artist. And, and I just recently purchased a piece from LA from a young artist and it was more expensive to ship it than it was to buy it. <laughs> but, but it was really good, and I'm glad mm -hmm. she told me to do it. Joy, Dr. Joy Simmons from L.A., she suggests things. She came up to Portland. I said, you got to come. She came in. She went, I got to buy that. I got to get back to the airport, John. Let's go. She walked in, bought it, and then back to the airport in one day. She's like, yeah, you're right. This is good. Um, they came down to Portland. I took them to a couple artist studios. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's just, you mm -hmm. did, that's the way it happens. Mm -hmm. um, oh, go ahead. Well, I wanted to ask you, well, both of you. So if you look at your work, you look at the work that you have in the collection, and you look at the, the styles or the imagery or whatever, what do you think that collection says about you? Um, so um, I have to take a, great a question. I have to take a step back and say, um, I studied uh, philosophy and worked in high tech in my first career uh, and always dabbled in art, and I went back and I got a BFA from a local college, Cornish. So um, I see art and I see something in the technique that I can fix my head around. I think it is there or coming there. Um, Lisa, my wife, uh, meets the artist, hears their story, and she approaches it from that way. So if you come to our house um, and you're not too overwhelmed, um, you generally get from us that we have an intimate connection to each piece, and it doesn't take long to get that, right? I, I mean, you don't, they don't all look the same. It's not like they're all buildings or they're all faces or they're all whatever. Um, I, I did say to you, though, Jeremy, um, we are sensitive um, to nuance. And a number of years ago, I read a book by the late uh, Okui, I, I always screw up his last name, Enzo Okui. Yeah. Uh, he was the curator at Haus der Kunst in Germany, passed away, did so many seminal shows, uh, African curator. And um, he talked about what you bring to the art when you look at it. So we avoid mm. um, photography of plagues and riots mm -hmm. and tropes that you might expect to see out of Africa. Mm -hmm. we, we go out of our way to um, not collect that because I feel like that's a trope that people expect to see when they hear about photography of Africa, the plagues, pestilence. But we have a lot of art about war. You just have to know the story, and we'll tell you the mm -hmm. story, but you, I think, leave feeling more positively mm -hmm. about the person who created. What did mm -hmm. you say? The flower out of the crack of the sidewalk. Yeah, the the, the rose that grew from concrete. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and a lot of the work has these very aspirational stories from a very vast group of artists from yeah. all over. But and, there's and, tragedy and there. I mean, there's. I won't say a lot of tragedy, but there's a lot of inner 
current that mm -hmm. these artists are portraying. Mm -hmm. um, the piece of yours that we gave away, the, the boat, um, had both, um, you know, despair and mm -hmm. and and uh, drama hanging over, and yet there was something about it between the colors and and everything yeah. that made me want to look at it and feel like things were were coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look through it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you for for sharing that, Joseph. So. Uh, I want to get uh, a couple more questions before we leave to to a Q and A, uh, and I'll go with with you, Barbara. Success as an artist. What is the formula? Well, I think the first success is when you whether you're self-taught, whether you graduate, go to the school, and get out, is that you realize once you step out the door. Nobody cares if you do it except you. Mm. Mm. And if you, I, I like to say that if you decide on a Wednesday you're, you're going to not paint, no one will be picketing outside your door <laughs> asking you please to not make that decision. Yeah. So I think the first, the first sort of success for me was realizing that I actually really wanted to do this and that, because it's painful, it's super painful to go in and face something blank and to know that you're, you need to start. Um, and if you don't start, I mean, it, there, it, there's always that, imp that feeling like, what if you just didn't? Oh, life would be so much easier. Mm. So I think that was my first success. And um, also being mm. able to critique my own work, mm. you know, to mm -hmm. say, you know, I don't care what anybody says, but this is not working out right here. <laughs> you may like it, but I know it's not working. <laughs> And so I remember one day literally opening the door, you know, after being out of school for maybe four or five years and inviting all of my professors to leave the room because, you know, I was still hearing their voices. I'm still hearing Jacob. I'm still hearing mm -hmm. Michael. I'm still hearing Norman Lindeen or whoever it was. Yeah. And I said, you can leave now because I really have to be the one who says whether or not this piece is working. So that was the other success. And then it was realizing that everybody wasn't going to like you. Mm -hmm. And that there was going to be people who you have an audience and there's some people who are not your audience. I mean, I've had all kinds of things said to me. I had one guy was had a piece on the wall. The guy walks up and he looks at it and he says, I can tell you're a woman and you hate men. Oh. I said, nobody comes empty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do the work. Yeah. Or someone coming up and they had a whole, th you know, they just gave me a whole story. I said, well, you know what? I expect everyone who comes has their own story. They're going to see what they bring, mm -hmm. and maybe they'll see something else. So my success is living through all those kinds of things and also living through rejection and not having that be. I remember the first time I got a rejection. Remember when the Bellevue Art Museum, mm -hmm. they used it at the, the fair. Then remember they would make you fill out the card. So this is like so humiliating. You take your work. They give you a postcard. You put a stamp on it, and then you write your address on the other side. So you get a card in the mail and with your own handwriting that tells you you're rejected. Oh. <laughs> and so, oh. And so I remember getting that card, and I, and I just, just, I just, it's like someone sucked the air right out of my mouth with a vacuum. And then I looked at the card, and I said, so what would you have liked it to say? I don't want you. No, not today or something. And I thought, well, you know what? You get 20 minutes to be upset about this, and mm -hmm. then you got to be over it. Move on. And so that was the, the other part of my success, is that, you know, so the things that happen to other people are not happening to me, you got to be over that. Mm -hmm. So those are the things, I think, that have been part of the success. And to remember that your life isn't in the press. If I'm not going to believe it when they say I'm horrible, then I'm not going to hang my hat on it when they say I'm just yeah. marvelous. Yes. Mm. And so somewhere in between there is some truth. I like the, you're just marvelous. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah you yeah. know, I, if someone said, God, you just, I, I just love that. But I know that it, it, it's, you know, it, it's, 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 it's here. It's the not, conversation is it's with you. It's not there. It's not in the paper. I'm not going to look at the paper to see what I'm doing today. So that is where I think 
the success lies, and I do want my work to sell. I do want it. So I'm not lying to myself about that. I don't want to have a whole room full of my things that I've just done. I want them to go find other homes. Mm. So that's where I think if I have a formula, it's that. And I am, um, I just keep a certain amount of amazement about the fact that people want to take it home and they do collect it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Barbara, is success also correcting some wrongs at that East Coast University? Uh, you mean the the Yale place? Yes. Well, I think that was a that was a great opportunity. Yeah. I was talking about I got a com commission to do a project at Yale, and I uh, replaced the windows that were broken, uh, that had to do with uh, John Calhoun, who was the one of our presidents who thought <laughs> slaves were happy mm -hmm. in their. I guess he and what's the guy in J Florida. Mm -hmm. yeah, to to yeah, who thinks that, you know, we... You learned a skill. I right. learned a skill. Yeah. yeah. And so I, you know, it was such a wonderful opportunity. And also, again, I felt the, the weight of history. Mm -hmm. I felt I had an opportunity in the weight of history. And it's not just black history. The weight of American history mm -hmm. and how I approach it. Because my way of thinking is... I. If I'm going to teach or do anything, it's by how I approach the world mm -hmm. and how I step into it and um, how I um, interact with that. So yeah. I was trying to address yeah. all of those those things. Mm -hmm. As an that's artist. not just success yeah. for you, though. That's success for us yeah. and all of us. Well, you Absolutely. know, we got that thing where, you know, you're proud of all the colored kids that <laughs> do <Yeah>. well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I go up there, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. And the guy, yeah. You don't even know me. I said, yeah. I, yeah. I'm still proud of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, still yeah, love yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, John, I uh, want to bring it to you. Uh, what is uh, happening now at the Portland Art Museum mm -hmm. that people can expect yeah. um, in the near future? Yeah. Um, I hope that you'll come down to see our Black Artists of Oregon and our Africa Fashion. We'd love to host you and welcome you there. Anybody, you, actually. You, you should understand that, that the African Fashion uh, is coming from the Brooklyn Museum where it was written up in all mm. of the press. So for people who say, I can't get to New York because yeah. it's far away, you can drive down to play. Yes. I mean, I don't want to skip your next show, right? but your excuse is gone when you say, oh, <laughs> I never get to New York. Yes. I don't get to see those mm -hmm. shows. Mm -hmm. We're bringing just it. a bus ride away. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, originated at the Victoria and Albert, and we went over to take a peek at the in, in London, and we went over to take a peek at that, and thought this is spectacular. And uh, they offered it to Brooklyn next, and then we were the, we are the only West Coast venue, so we'd love to have you come. November eighteenth is our uh, opening, so we'd love to have you there. Big gala. We're gonna have a fashion show. It's gonna be really cool. Um, but the thing we're most excited about, and he already has his ticket. Mm -hmm. um, is we just announced on, what was that, Thursday, that Jeffrey Gibson, uh, the, the Native American artist with whom we had a major survey about f six months ago, we nominated him for to be the American at the Biennial, and mm. he was elected. And yes, we were so excited, are so excited. And, uh, and, and as Joseph and, and Barbara already have referred, everything looks east. And so West Coast museums rarely get it, especially one of our size. So uh, we have a Native American curator who came from the Smithsonian who wrote the uh, grant and the opportunity, and they accept that she's the first Native American woman to curate a show at the Biennial. And he He's the first Native American person, and we are all going to be there in April of, of 2024 uh, in Venice, so we'd love to have you all come there, and we are as excited about it and proud of him as we can possibly be. And I'm just thinking, we and, and like you're, you're, you're talking about these artists that you don't know, when we first met him for the survey, it was like two years ago, and we went out to the screen door. It's like an old soul food restaurant and there we are talking with this young man and he signed my coat like okay thanks for signing my coat and now he's the most famous guy in america for now so anyway wow. that's what we're doing at the portland art museum that's amazing yeah. well um and i'm sure you all will go to their website to sign up for the newsletter so you guys can yeah. find um get the rsvp because that sounds like a really really great show yes uh, and I'll bring the last question to, to Joseph. I mean, you've talked so much about uh, advice from collectors. You know, just to round it off, like, what is your advice for collectors? I mean, new and, and seasoned. Um, 
I don't. I guess you know how I started by saying I have a lot of don'ts and no's. Um, don't buy anything you don't love. Yep. Buy it to put it on your wall. Doesn't matter. So um, there is, uh, there was a couple. There's still a couple, but uh, it was uh, John and Mary Shirley. Uh, Mary passed away. Uh, if you don't know who they are, go into any museum here in Seattle, and they either gave them the land <laughs> or put the first dollar down. Um, John and Mary were generous beyond words. Um, I can remember going to Mary's house and going downstairs for a cup of coffee. And she, do you, do you know that painting of dogs playing poker mm -hmm. that you can buy for <laughs> about $2 anywhere? <laughs> she had that over the bar next to paintings that cost $10 million because she liked it. Yeah. If you like it, put it on the wall. Don't buy anything because you think you're going to make money on it unless you are a day trader mm -hmm. uh, because you, never you, know. might, you might not. But I, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask me um, <laughs> <laughs> just for the heck of it. It just came up in my, uh, my, uh, my list of things. Yeah, it just came up in your list. So um, I have a, a, a studio practice. I paint, and I am blessed to be booked out about four or five months in advance now. Uh, John got me a few commissions. Uh, I, I've, I, as a fluke during COVID, I started uh, shifting from painting people to painting dogs and cats, and nobody loves their family <laughs> more than dog owners. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, um, and I don't advertise, I don't show it, I don't have a website, I have a little, few things on Instagram, and uh, the st it's always the same, but you know you've made it, so I'm standing in a booth at Art Basel, the biggest art show in the world with the most expensive art and the most amazing people. I'm there on the opening day and there is an artist who sells for a lot of effing money. And um, the gallery dealer turns to him and says, you know, Joseph paints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and before he can control himself, his eyeballs roll across <laughs> his head. Because here's a guy who's got a line of 100 people who want to buy his art, and they can't get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the dealer says, no, Joseph, show him, you know, a photograph. And the dealer says, he painted my dog. Yeah. So uh, the artist does one of these, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, show me your painting. Well, needless to say, he commissioned me to paint his dog. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that is, for me, success. success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that is what it comes down to. It's not that he asked me. So it is that he respects me enough in my craft, the way I respect him in his craft, mm -hmm. You know, I'm never going to have the New York Gallery and I'm never going to get a New York Times review or a museum show like Barbara. But, um, it, you know, I respect this artist and he wants me to paint something that he's going to put in his house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, success means different things mm -hmm. to different people. But it's not a hobby for me. I get up every morning and I paint. Mm -hmm. And all of the, as Barbara said, Nobody asks me on Wednesday if, I, if I'm going to go to watch TV or whatever. Successful artists get up. They get out of bed. You know, uh, was it Matisse painted from his bed on a long stick because <laughs> he was too sick to sit up. It's, it's a little bit of a compulsion, yeah. but, but that's what... That's what crazy people do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we do. So yeah. I didn't answer your question, yes. but yeah. there you go. Well, thank you for adding that that question to answer. Uh, you know, I, you certainly circle, circled it around as just buying art you love, and and from buying art you love is finding out about that work. You know, talking to that artist or the gallery to um, hear their their story or look at their craftsmanship. Uh, and you know something that's unique to, to Dot Red is when we do our, our online exhibitions is that we we have those conversations with the artists and the gallerists, and and talk about each of those pieces. And you can hear 
from each of those pieces um, a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation about that piece. And it, it's so important for um, viewers, but also the, the, the artwork to have a life of its own for others to enjoy, to bring on their home, or also just to reflect on. And, and so uh, we have a, a next show, an online show, uh, John Simmons, who's award-winning photographer, beautiful black and white photography. And, and the, when you have these kinds of conversations, like those are the things that really deepen our sense of self and enrich our lives. And that's why, as I think sort of circling around, we, we, we bring the art to our home. That's why we like to see it on our walls, wherever we can, uh, and be inspired by those works. Uh, so, so thank you, um, all of you, for, for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we're gonna go to, to, to Q&A next. Uh, when we get to q and I do want to share, when you're asking a question, it is a question, it is not a statement. And with your question, um, please be as succinct as possible. And for any one of these fine people, um, you can direct a question to one person or you can direct the question to all. Uh, um, that's all I ask. And we have a mic right here. And what we'll do is uh, for the person, just raise your hand and we will bring the mic over to you. So who has a question? We will start with my dear here. <laughs> yeah, I've got a question about um, museums. Yes. And, so it sounds like you're doing a lot and can you start with your name sure. first and, and, then sh and then ask the question? Oh, okay. Yep. Hi, I'm Nikisha. Nikisha, it's a pleasure. <laughs> okay, so I'm interested in how you are um, encouraging your, ooh, and, and uh, yeah, bring your, it up just a little your audience mm -hmm. and, uh, and your membership and whatnot to explore uh, more diverse art and you know, outside of the traditional 18th century and whatnot. Right. Um, yeah, how are you actually doing that? And yeah. is it, are you bringing in new audiences or are you actually trying to educate yeah. and to grow? You know? We're bringing in new audiences for sure. Um, we started that with Hank Willis Thomas. Um, when Hank decided, uh, when we decided to do the survey for him, he came into Portland and he says, uh, John, what I would like to do in the, uh, the main space where we're going to have the show is we would like to have a DJ. I was like, we don't normally do DJs at the Fort Hart Museum. He says, well, I'd like to do that. And I said, okay, we'll figure that out. He says, but I want to be the black uh, DJ. His name is Ambush. He has a radio station called Numbers. It's like, I didn't know. I'm so sorry, but we'll talk to Ambush and see if that can happen. And we talked to him, and he did come, and it was astounding. We had the biggest black audience we'd ever had in the museum, and they continue to come. And Numbers lost their lease during COVID and didn't have a place to do their radio shows, and so we moved them into the museum. We were closed for 18 months, and no revenue, no anything, but a lot of space. So he moved into our museum, and he has stayed. Now he's a part of the museum, and we have a black-owned radio station in the museum. And, and he does podcasts, he does interviews. Whenever we have artists coming in, he interviews them to get m make sure that everybody knows that they're coming and they can call in and ask questions and things like that so that's one way um, my Instagram I always go I'll be posting about Barbara here in a little bit um, I always make sure that everybody knows what who I'm visiting and who I think that they should be looking at and who when when they come to the museum I also go around and I point out paintings that they should come in and see um, when we are visiting other cities all over the world we always make sure there's a person of color that we're going to be visiting. We visited Barbara, as I mentioned, so they get to know her and know her work and, and, and feel more comfortable with her and all the things that she's doing. Um, that's some of the ways that we're doing, and we are just as much in the public audience as we can possibly be telling people the story. of The museum, it, the museum used to be two giant monolithic brick buildings, no windows, and so foreboding, and I would never go in there, so we're going to build a glass box right in the middle of those two museums. It's transparent. We're doing a, a black space for black art only in one of the museums. We don't have it. We have Japanese art. We have Chinese art. We have Korean art. We have uh, uh, silver. We have modern, contemporary. No black art section, but we're building one. And it's going to be right in the glass box so that 24 hours a day, you can walk through and see it. 
and that's something that we're working $140 million. We're getting pretty close to getting that done. So, yep, we're working. And, and there was one other thing I wanted to say is, um, oh, you were asking about success, Jeremy. Yes. Success to me is Barbara was in her studio today, and she was saying that these kids come in, and they count the number of snakes, the number of birds in her painting. That's success. When I hear those kids in there looking at those incredible paintings and seeing themselves, I'm done. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikisha. Appreciate your question. We have another question. Who's going to be the courageous one? Thank you. And you bring the mic up. Is that better? Oh, yes, yeah. that's <laughs> great. And, and if you can please start with your name. Okay. And then. Um, I'm Margie Ralph, and I am a mom of three small children and a high school English teacher. What advice would you give me to help foster my daughter's love for art? And what advice would you give me as a public educator? in fostering my students' love of art? It's not easy. I think that um, I would say that you find the things that your daughter does already that look creative to you or look like they are. I always, I mean, it was a long time that I, before I would even call myself an artist, and I still think of myself as a maker. I make things because the first impetus was because I needed a thing. I need a thing to cover that, whatever. So I make that thing. And you know, when I grew up again, there was no Amazon or anything. You made the thing that right. you needed it to have. So I think to find that and then point out the creative aspects of that. And I mean, because everybody makes uh, aesthetic decisions every single day and it might be how they dress or how they present themselves, how they speak. And I think that now it's a lot easier to talk about the many ways that art and creativity live in the world. So it's not just the painting on the wall, but it might be you know, the way you present yourself or the way you move in the world. So I, I think that that kind of thing really helps anyone. And I think, again, for the students, I think it's interesting because there's so many, I think that the reason, another reason the creative process is so important is that it allows a certain kind of bravery that isn't the kind of bravery that we think of, you know, you go into the war, you, you know, you shoot the enemy, you do whatever. It takes a bravery to think about things that you've not done before and take a chance. And I always like to say that if there's anything that art does, is it, it's the proof of your faith. And faith is starting with nothing and after coming again to the studio, as, as he said, and coming again and finding something that was not there before is what we're here on the planet to do. And if we're not doing that, we're just emulating everything that's already happened. And it's not to say that, you know, you make the thing that, you know, it's a, a landscape and people have always made ma landscapes. But there's something new to see. And that's what you're trying to help them do. And that's what I try to do in my relationships and in my, in my work. And um, I'm not sure if there's anything original or new under the sun, but there is only the way you can do it that... Um, people will be able to, to see you in a different way because it is about communication. I have a postscript. Mm -hmm. um, Am I dead? No, ah. no, no, no. <laughs> a, a PS to that. Barbara. Mm -hmm. So um, we have always taken our kids mm -hmm. to museums. When I, when I was a child, uh, schools always took you each year took you to a museum. They took you to... The symphony. Symphony, yeah, went to the symphony, the the, uh, whatever. They took you. The money's gone. Mm -hmm. They don't do that anymore. Um, some museums have programs, but, but we always take our kids. Uh, my children love the fact that when we travel, we're going to include a museum. Now, we're not the typical parents because I can walk in a museum and lecture on a number of the artists, but 
it is the fact that I then care what they like. So I explain to them the way you go through a museum is you go in and you pick a few pieces in each room. It doesn't have to be a lot of rooms, just a few. And you look at those pieces together. You don't have to, it's not a, an assignment. Mm -hmm. You don't have to start at one and make your kids look at every piece because then they really will hate art. But uh, we just say, pick a few pieces, we go up. If there's pedagogy, if there's writing on the wall, we read it. If not, we discuss it. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I will say to them, you can clearly see the influence of, <laughs> you know, in the style of, um, and there have been days when I end up with people standing behind us, mm -hmm. and they're yeah. like, is this a tour? Where did you? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, they love it because there's no right or wrong. You know, you can look at a few pieces. Um, so, uh, I mean, I have to throw that out. If you don't take your kids to a museum because you think they won't appreciate it, take them to a show, and, and if they only look at four pieces, take them downstairs afterwards and buy them ice cream so yeah. their memory right. is a good one. Is a good one. Mm -hmm. Every time yeah. they think of art, they go, ice cream. Ice cream, <laughs> ice cream, ice cream. <laughs> but, but they'll think of art. Yeah. yeah. Three points. I'll be real quick, I promise. You said be succinct. Uh, teachers do deserve better, yes. Uh, second thing is that um, we have a poster series that I would love. I'll give you my card. If you'd like, I'll send it to you. We do a series of posters every year from all of the different types of art that we have in the museum. On the back is an incredible history of the art and how it's, a, how it's made, what all, everything about it that the curators do. We send those to all the teachers, and the teachers share it with their kids before they come in. And when they come in, they don't want to see me. They don't want to see, well, they would want to see you, but they will, I want to see Barbara's work right now. I don't care about you, Mr. Goodwin. I need to see Barbara. And they go straight to it. So they're all enthused. And there was one other point I wanted to make, and I can't remember what it was. Um, the teachers, the posters, and oh, um, if, you, if you'd like to get the posters, share one, uh, give you not only for you, for, to, for your teachers, but give you some for your daughter too. So she'll have them in her room. Mm -hmm. So she'll always have something that she's familiar with. Okay? Yeah. No, those are great. I just want to echo one thing that, that John was saying was if you can find the artist, work with the artist, it makes a huge difference yeah. for them to create the, the relationship between, between the yeah. art and the artist and, and give them the opportunity to ask those questions yeah. because we, we actually did a, a tour uh, with youth, uh, education tours um, back in 2016 and 17 and youth had the best questions. Yeah. Much, much better than adults. I mean, adults can be pretty boring sometimes, but the kids will ask questions that you have never yeah, thought of. Groups. And yeah. it, it makes a, a big point when they can speak directly, directly to the artist, you know, if, if you have the ability to. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's really important because I do think that, you know, just as, as you're working in de development, yes. people give to people. Yes. You mm -hmm. know, they don't necessarily give to the museum. Right. They give to people. They they like you. They look yeah. they said, Barbara, they they like me. They they want to give to the this cause. Right. And I think that um, you know, I said, while I'm alive, you should talk to me. Because yes. when I I don't know if it's <laughs> yes. gonna happen. I <laughs> and I think that again, if anything has changed for me, it's that having that, you know, you meet people, you talk to them, they have questions and they're they, they just like having that connection. Mm -hmm. And so I don't meet everybody that buys my work. I don't, but the people that I do, I feel like there is something that happens. And also I learn. And I was saying to, to someone, I said, them liking my work, it sort of completes the, the cycle for me. You know, I do the work, I put it in the world, and then someone comes and they tell me what they see. And then I look and I might learn something new about the piece I've made or I see something that they see that I didn't see when I made it. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that, that it's, it's about, for me, it's about the communications yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yes, yeah. we'll, we'll come back to you. I think we got one more question left. Hi, my name is Nikisha. <laughs> Hi, Nikisha. <laughs> um, so speaking of people who buy art, mm -hmm. a question for all three of you in your respective roles. What can be done to diversify 
the collector ecosystem because currently the art world, as you guys know, like it's not particularly inclusive or diverse. Um, I've seen a lot of artists who are you know, advocating for things like you know, sell to black collectors, for mm. example. Um, but, but what specifically could, could be done? Oh, they're gonna, to everybody's going to look at me. Um, I think uh, sure, I, would we can. <laughs> I would say um, I, I would say is it is the question asked because they can't go into a gallery and get respected? Is the question asked because of the economic underpinnings of the price of art? I mean, you have to give me a hook to hang it on because. Yep. Yep. Who gets what? Um, I don't think you're going to make a Jeffrey Deitch or a Gagosian turn his back on the people that have built his empire. Um, I mean, Gagosian doesn't know who I am, and if I go into his gallery, he's not selling to me. And, and trust me, I've got galleries all over the world desperate for my wallet. Um, so it, it never ends. Um, but I think that you need to start by recognizing that it's a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there are some galleries uh, who really would like to uh, get their black artists into black collectors' hands, and they make it known. Uh, there are some a Asian, collect Asian galleries. You know, I mean, I could just throw some out. I'm not as good here. I know there is one that's working hard, but um, Mickey Meng in San Francisco is Asian. Uh, there's... Um, uh, Marian Ibrahim in Chicago, there's Paris. Uh, Kibum Kim in LA, w in Koreatown, who has a very diverse collection. There's uh, Karen Jenkins Johnson in San Francisco. I mean, there are a, 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 there are a lot more, um, I'm just forgetting a whole bunch in New York. Yeah. There's a lot more galleries with directors and ownership that is in the minority, and they are working very, very hard and tirelessly to find collectors that mirror the color of their artists, to yeah. put it bluntly. You know, they want the diversity to go both ways. Um, I have, I, may I? Yeah, quick, go ahead. Barbara, may I jump in really quickly? Sure. The, the thing I suggest to young collectors who are looking at a different price point is prints. I love, I collect prints and I produce prints and publish prints for artists that uh, their works are way beyond what I and, and a lot of other people can afford. Uh, so prints are a much more affordable place to start. And, and once you learn how, you, you look for limited editions, you look for smaller editions, the smaller the better, um, and you start with that and then you work your way through to the next artist who does something similar. And you try to not, I don't mean to suggest that offset prints are not prints, but they are, they're a different type. If you do monoprints or lithographs or serographs or things like that where there's actually texture and paint on paper, it, it feels more like the original piece and, and then they're amazingly different price point, much, much more reasonable. And I collect, uh, you have Andy Warhol's Mammy, I have Andy Warhol's Cows, I have a lot of different prints by different, uh, and Hank Willis Thomas, and so uh, I think that's a good place to start for people with their. Yeah, but it's a game. It is a it game. Is. Yeah. You know, so here's your choice. Uh, think of a job interview. You know, we all, well, we don't all have children, but if you have children, they're going to go for a job interview. And they're not going to want to get out of their jeans and t shirt. Yeah. And they're going to want to go into that job interview and say, you shouldn't care what I'm wearing because I got amazing skills. Yeah. And you're going to say to them, <laughs> first impression. Play the game. Once you get the job, let your hair grow out, be a freak. Put your ring, your nose but ring But you've got to get in the door. So mm -hmm. there is a game. 
I, I mean, do you want to play the game or don't you want to play the game? I mean, y you know, young, um, young children of every persuasion, immigrants, every ethnicity have faced hurdles and have had to make a decision what part of the game is worth playing and what isn't, okay? My uh, un late uncle changed his name because they weren't hiring Jews to be CPAs. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't even think of that stuff. I, I, you know, when I applied for jobs, I just assumed I'd get them, but, but what part of the game, and if the game is representing whatever your niche is into whatever artist niche, do the research. Go online, find out who the dealers are. They want to work with you. They, the artists want their work. They want their work in people's homes who look like them. I hear that constantly yeah. from artists. Yep. They tell me that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you mentioned, we were talking that, you know, there are many times where you aren't given the opportunity to, to purchase work. And, and so you have to then play the game as well. So, so it, it, it does, um, it, while it may appear that, that it, there is a marginalization, there is still a vast um, group of, of galleries who absolutely have a direction of yeah. who they allow to purchase their work and who doesn't. And so if you are interested, as you mentioned, you must be willing to let go of some of those preconceived notions and find out, you know, what, what, what would work, right? L.A., okay. Band of Vices. This is a guy that, that he would kill to have people that look like him. Mr. Terrell. Yeah, yep. yeah. rather than me. Come, I mean, he loves that I buy all his artists, but he would rather have you. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has really left Hollywood for that reason. Um, I, I mean, I can, you know, names as I drive home, I'll think, why didn't I say Joanna <laughs> in, in New York for We Buy Go? Why didn't I say, but um, uh, Nic Nicola Vaselli in New York. There are many more galleries than when I first started buying and they really, but it starts by going in, introducing yourself, and going back, and introducing yourself, mm -hmm. and going back, and follow his website. You know, I mean, he, he clearly is going to have a sensitivity to um, artists that are not the mainstream, getting all of the attention, mm -hmm. who have interesting stories to tell, um, and, you know, it is a bit of a game, yeah. right? And right. I think in the game, I think you need to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's the problem, you know, in this country or maybe in the world. Everybody wants it to all happen now. And I think that we're in, you know, I've been alive long enough to watch the thing go up. I was in this, uh, the 70s and the 80s and the watching thing go up and down and up and down. And, you know, the questions that people are asking now are not new questions. You know, their questions have been asked since, you know, you know, in 1920 or whatever, you know, and I think that it's the long haul, it's the long view. I don't know if this thing that we're in right now is a blip, you know, because George Floyd got killed. I don't know. My work was selling before, but I don't know. But I do know that I'm serious. Yeah. That's I right. know that, that I'm right here there. for the long haul. That's right. I know that I'm going to get up and make work. That's right. So there are going to be many people that maybe decide, you know, it was interesting because people bought my a whole bunch of my work right at the beginning because I, I was doing this kind of imagery. So what I wanted to put out was that for the artist, do the work that's really your work. If, it's, if it is figurative work and it's about a certain subject and it really is what you want to do, Go for it, but don't do it because you think it's the thing of the moment. Because that moment will pass. That's right. And it'll That's pass right. right by you. And you or you'll get worn out. So I think it's the long haul. You know, it's that long haul thing. You know, is this for fifty years? You know, is you know, I might not be alive when this thing when you look back and go like, 
oh, wow, that happened, and it's still happening, and now it's ensconced. Now it's, you know, it's part of the canon. Now we're not asking that question anymore. There'll be another question to ask, you know, in terms of... Well, if you're a Latinx artist today, you can't get a museum show mm -hmm. unless you're at one or two or three of the museums mm -hmm. that, yeah. that do that. Focus. I mean, the same thing that you heard 15 years ago mm -hmm. from the African-American community, you're hearing... Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they, they can't even get representation in a lot of places, mm -hmm. let alone get their collectors to come through the door to find their works. Um, you know, there's a certain gender fluid group that can't find galleries that are interested in representing them as who they are, let alone reaching. So, I mean, the, the question is eternal, as you said. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, we've been collecting African dias um, diaspora art for 30 years. You know, uh, I just, I would have hoped that by now, nobody would be asked, no, I, I would have hoped by now there wouldn't be a need of a black art section. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be a need of almost any section. Mm -hmm. Maybe a book that yeah. made some connections. Mm -hmm. You'd go into a museum and, and you wouldn't care or you'd just see. You'd see the art. Yeah. You'd right. see the art. art. I mean, we keep having the, se you know, these we, same questions. We're, you know, we're deal. Uh, trust me, I'm an old person. We're dealing with Roe v. Wade. Yeah. Mm. I thought when I got <laughs> out of high school, we had moved. So these questions take the long view. It ain't ever over till the fat lady sings. And then it'll be something yeah. else. But I think again, you mm. go into it, we'll and it you and you and you just and you stay. You keep. Mm being there until you're not. Mm -hmm. Integrity. And, then that, and, that, mm -hmm. that's it. and I do feel we need to give ourselves some uh, pat on the back for the fact that we have made some, whether, whether it's microscopic or not, because we're the kind of c culture that we only, well, yeah, we, we got that done, but we, what, what about all these things that aren't done? You've bought work. Other people have bought mm. work. So can we stop and say some things have happened Yes. And we that's an example that somebody bought my work and ain't nobody died. Yeah. That's you right. You know, so I think that that <laughs> is, you know, where And you're on this panel. I'm on yeah. this panel with that's you know right, all my yeah. August friends. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, such a incredible conversation. I want to thank um, we are, are finished with our with our panel discussion. Thank you all for, for joining. Thank you. I want to thank John Goodwin at the Portland Art Museum. I want to thank Joseph Vaskovitz. I want to thank Barbara Earl Thomas. I want to thank Gray Sky Gallery for thank allowing you. us in your space. Woo! I want to thank the Northwest African American Museum for being here to share and, and promote the uh, our panel discussion. I want to thank the Seattle Art Fair for uh, allowing us to be a cultural partner. Uh, I want to thank our team, uh, Taj over there at the bar. I want to thank Shiva, Amadi. Uh, I want to thank also our advisors, George Davis, Stephanie Ardery. And thank you all for, for joining us this evening. We'll have the uh, reception open um, until 8 p.m. Um, you can also check out uh, at our table, we have our, our newsletter if you're interested in signing up. Our next exhibition is uh, John Simmons, uh, uh, Black and White uh, Photography. Uh, it'll be open uh, September 6th. And uh, with that said, have a great evening and uh, the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um.